Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Barrier Breakdown. My name is Erin Molino Bailey. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and my co host, Dr. Kevin Caridad, who is the CEO and founder at Cognitive Behavior Institute. Uh, Thanks so much for being with us this week on the podcast. We are here today to talk about living with borderline personality disorder. And we have a a guest with us today. Her name is Rakshika. And Rakshika is here because she is going to talk to us a little bit about her background and her personal experience with borderline personality. So Rakshika, thank you so much for, for being here today. And could you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us a little bit about uh, you and your background. Sure, thank you so much, Erin. Um, my name is Rakshika, as um, you've already introduced, and uh, I am a law graduate by qualification, but uh, I recently moved on from law because I realized it did not make me happy anymore. So currently I'm working with a DTC brand uh, called Amrutam that basically makes Ayurvedic healthcare accessible uh, it's based out of India, but it ships globally. So I'm working there as a community and marketplace manager. And uh, talking about uh, my personal life, I was born and raised in India currently. And like I have been living in India all my life. And um, I was raised with very traditional Indian values. There was a lot of discipline involved in the way that I was raised. And uh, the terms like mental health or depression or trauma, they did not really exist. I mean, even today, my family is unaware that uh, I struggle with borderline personality disorder. So um, I grew up in a small town in the central part of the country, and um, there was no access to, um, forget about access, nobody even talked about mental health as a concept. And um, when I was young, this was never a part of any dinner discussions or whatsoever. Um, however, my parents were very keen on ensuring that I had the had access to the best kind of education. And uh, the schools that I went to actually opened up a lot of doors for me. I met a lot of people from different walks of life. And reading was another thing that exposed me to the range of emotions that humans were capable of feeling. I enjoyed reading fiction, which is basically opening you to the world full of possibilities. And that's when I realized for the first time that, you know, um, people were capable of feeling different emotions. And um, gradually, um, that made me more more self-aware and made me more in touch with my emotions and feelings. So that that would be the bit about me. So it it sounds like, at least culturally from growing up, emotions aren't something that are expressed uh, or... Uh, can you speak to more about what are the cultural norms with regard to how what emotions is it okay to express them? What is that? Tell us a little bit more about that since our audience is US based. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Kevin, for that question. I actually thought it was important for me to set the cultural context um, while I was talking about myself because I don't see a lot of South Asian representation when it comes to uh, psychological issues or psychiatric issues for that matter. Um, a lot of uh, theories or techniques that are used, um, you know, when even by professionals, when they're dealing with a certain disorder, they're purely from a Western sense. And that's because that was the kind of education, that was the kind of progress that the West had made long before, you know, at least in this realm. While we do have concepts like, you know, Ayurveda, which talks about spiritualism and the mind, body, soul connect it's not really um, given the kind of regard that it deserves, um, at least as of um, the last hundred years or so. But I do believe that uh, India um, as a cultural, you know, in the culture of India does not necessarily talk about mental health, um, which is, uh, which has changed. I would admit that it has changed in the last decade or so. And um, so typically, Mental health issues are seen as rich people problems. Common man, like, you know, India, there are two sides of India, the one that's really progressing. We have, um, you're producing the CEOs of the world, but then we also see people who are struggling to make ends meet. 
uh, who are struggling with poverty, who do not have basic amenities. So imagine somebody who does not have the basic amenities talking about mental health. That feels like a privilege, you know, in a lot of ways. So the emotions that I um, was exposed to a lot growing up was anger was very normalized. So India is largely patriarchal, at least in the most uh, states that I have, uh, I'm not traveled the entire country, but I can tell you from what, like, whatever it is that I know that um, it's very patriarchal in nature. So rage, anger, frustration, these are the emotions that are very commonly seen, whereas um, softness, gentleness are more feminine qualities that are attrib attributed to a feminine character. So uh, just being in touch with your emotions was never really considered a good thing, or even if it was a thing, it was just um, restricted to women or people who identified as women. So, I mean, when we look at it, there's a lot of, there's a big intersectional lens at it when we talk about the cultural lens uh, and how psychological issues have been dealt with, uh, at least in the South Asia. But um, yeah, I think it was important for me to set that cultural uh, context before diving into what borderline personality is and how I have dealt with it. Tell us a little bit about um, the symptoms that you were experiencing or how your journey began um, and with, through your diagnosis. Sure. So um, I've always known uh, in some way that, uh, um, that I've been... Um, very interested in you know learning about myself, um, and there have been times, multiple times actually, when I've had an identity an, an identity crisis of sorts, where I wasn't very sure as to who I was or what I liked or where I belonged, and that was quite disturbing for me because you know when you're a young child, I think when you lack direction or when you lack guidance, that can be really confusing for you because especially in your formative years, you don't see get the right kind of guidance. It can really sort of scar you or just make you feel lost. And um, so I did um, experience those sorts of emotions, um, but I never really paid a lot of attention to it because I was always an active child. I always uh, kept myself busy. I always have dance classes to go to. I was, I enjoyed studying, I enjoyed debating. So, I mean, there wasn't a lot of time to pay heed to my emotions. And nor were we taught that emotions were important. You know, if I was feeling overwhelmed or like if I was angry or upset, I would just maybe cry and that would be it. That would be behind me. Um, but I would say I did have a close group of friends um, who had like, like I had mentioned earlier that, you know, I was able to interact with people from different walks of life. So I did have a few friends who were struggling with mental health issues and who were in therapy at the time. And uh, it was through them that I was, uh, you know, able to understand what was the process like and, you know, the kind of experiences that they were having. Now, my experience with the, my symptoms, um, I would say, was, um, I think that's something we can touch upon when we talk about what's called borderline personality disorder. But my experience with seeking um, um, uh, the help of a mental health professional came during the pandemic. I think the entire world was struggling back then. And uh, needless to say, uh, I was one of them. And uh, I was living with my family. I was still in my law school. And I was really, really struggling. Uh, I had all sorts of uh, suicidal thoughts. I literally saw no point in leading a life because, let's face it, there was no coming out of a you know deadly virus. And there was no way out. And... Um, I remember speaking to a few friends of mine, this one friend in particular, who also has um, BPD. And uh, she was casually mentioning about her symptoms to me once. And I'd always felt a very strong connection with her. And when she uh, shared about her symptoms with me, it instantly made me feel like, oh my God, I feel the same. And I think I you remember- You alone. I'm sorry? You didn't feel alone anymore. I mean, but I was also petrified that I had to live with something for the rest of my life. I mean, I think that's a really scary thought, you know, because even though you're alone, you're really not alone because there's a condition that, that's sort of attached to you. It's almost like a leech. And uh, I remember um, 
literally bawling my eyes out that night and feeling like, oh my God, I'm incurable. And, you know, I mean, of course, I did not get a formal diagnosis back then, but I was just so afraid of being diagnosed. And then I did something that I'm not proud to admit. I went online and I researched my symptoms. Uh, now, this is not something I would recommend anyone, but in hindsight, I now realized what I did was completely like natural. Like imagine someone was, who has questions about who they are, who are really not sure where they belong or what their role is. You don't see the point in living anymore. And suddenly you have this thing called the internet that's free and you have access to it. And that's probably like, you know, it offers you the slightest like opportunity to learn a little bit about yourself without like feeling completely lost. I did that. I went online and I researched my symptoms. I even took a BPD test. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but I did that. And I, I don't think those were reliable sources. Um, but I did that. And I knew that, you know, I had to confirm these doubts that I had about myself because um, I had to know, right? I had to give this a chance. And that's when I decided that this was uh, going to take a formal shape, that I was actually going to uh, seek mental health, um, help uh, of a professional. And uh, I, I was also very broke. I was a student, uh, I was still a student and I was working part-time, but I did not have enough to, um, you know, afford therapy. So another logic that I sort of used to convince myself when I was trying to self-diagnose was that therapy is not something I can afford, but the internet is something that's free and accessible. So I found a lot of comfort, um, you know, going on Reddit. And um, I was part of these Facebook groups that where a lot of people with BPD came together and talked about their experiences. I think that was really the topic. And uh, later I decided to seek help um, through this organization called Mind Peers. Um, they did this, they're still doing this incredible job in providing affordable therapy uh, at really, really reasonable rates. And uh, through them, I started my whole journey. And within the first couple of sessions, I was diagnosed by an RCI licensed uh, clinical psychologist. And uh, I would say that that actually helped me uh, getting that confirmation because until that point, I constantly felt like a really terrible person for experiencing those thoughts that I did, which we can talk about. But um, later, I was able to attribute it to like a certain condition uh, that was in a lot of ways controlling me uh, instead of the other way around. Um, that gave me a lot of relief in realizing that I wasn't a person with deviant tendencies. And it was actually something that had happened to me uh, and not something that I was controlling myself. That was a long answer. So it sounded like, you know, going through the process and getting help, it began to shift the way you thought about things and, and began to have hope and kind of and brings you to today. It sounds like you've really uh, had a great impact and living a better quality of life and understanding yourself and how to, how to look at things in a different way. No, absolutely. I think that made a lot of difference because um, I think especially the kind of person, I don't know this about BPD, but the kind of person that I am, I think most people, they seek validation, um, you know, for their emotions, whatever it is that they're feeling or experiencing and having a space, like a devoted space where I get to only talk about myself and my issues or just maybe just ramble about life or maybe rant about something. I think that space and especially moving away from home uh, last year, I became pretty independent and I think having that space of mine made me feel more in charge about my, of my life and gave me a sense of control that I think was lacking. Um, I would say at least during the pandemic when I felt the most helpless. Great. Well, we're glad to hear that you, um, that you're doing well right now. Do you have any, you know, words of advice for anyone else who may be um, on the fence about seeking treatment for these kinds of symptoms so that we can right. share? Yes. Um, I'm so sorry, I completely missed out about mentioning the symptoms, but uh, yeah, uh, as per the diagnostics uh, manual, there are nine symptoms of uh, BPD, which include the fear of abandonment, um, dramatic relationships, splitting, which is basically having ambivalent emotions, ambivalent feelings towards people that are close to you, 
um, having impulsive, reckless behaviors. And so all in all, there are, there are the nine symptoms. You can, of course, refer to reliable sources or the DSM for that matter. But um, I have experienced those uh, symptoms in varying degrees, all of those symptoms actually. And one thing that I've actually observed is that I did not feel each of these symptoms in isolation. They actually came in pairs or a group of three. So for, um, for instance, if I was involved with someone romantically, I would constantly be um, you know, terrified that they were going to abandon me or leave me. And that led to um, a lot of drama in that relationship. So there were, there were two symptoms that were sort of you know, playing around in this one particular situation. And similarly, when it came to uh, feeling extreme mood swings, I would often throw fits of anger and rage and maybe even have ambivalent emotions. Just sometimes there used to be days I used to really like want to talk to this one particular friend of mine and then I would really just not want to you know be around them at all. So yeah, but these uh, symptoms have been quite uh, disturbing on a lot of levels, but I've learned eventually to be able to manage them. And a word of advice that I would uh, give to people struggling with PPD would be um, do not attach a lot of importance to the label. Do not be fixated on BPD um, as a diagnosis because uh, then you'll be you'll not be able to see yourself as a whole person. You're always going to see yourself as a disorder, which I, and I've made that mistake. I've seen myself as a disorder for a very long time. And I can tell you that it really just restricted my growth as a person. And uh, I think now when I'm in therapy again, I realize that I'm able to talk more freely about my emotions without attributing every single thing. I don't think it's fair to always attribute it to BPD when you're sad or like, you know, always call it a low phase or always whenever you're happy, you can't always call it a manic episode. I think the line gets blurred quite easily. But uh, yeah, I think my only advice, my only piece of advice would be to not be very fixated on the label, but try to look at the bigger picture and see yourself as a full human being and not just a disorder. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, Rakshika. We wish you um, the best in your journey to mental health and wellness. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time to speak uh, with us here today and learn a little bit about your story. Thank you so much, Erin. It was lovely chatting with you. Thank you, Kevin. Wonderful. And thank, uh, thanks so much to our listeners for tuning in for this week's episode. And we will see you guys next week. We hope you all stay safe and healthy. Take care. Thanks for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast. Check out our website at cbicenterforeducation.com for more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events.